I was so excited to see what song I was doing tonight. <laughs> I am Carrie Obrey, the director of Midwest Booksellers Association and the co-director of Heartland Fall Forum. I would like to start our first ever Meet the Finalists event for the Heartland Bookseller Award by first introducing our sponsors. Our generous sponsors for the entirety of the show this year are HarperCollins, Ingram, Abrams Books, Wayne State University Press, Fuji Associates, Blackstone, Simon & Schuster, Penguin Random House, and Bink. As always, thank you all for stepping up and supporting the independent book selling industry, especially at this specific time in our history. And before we move on, I would like to also thank all of the publishers who are represented here tonight. All of you have brought all of these finalists together here tonight by publishing their books and sharing their time and their energy here with us. The publishers are Charles Bridge Publishing, Coffee House Press, Copper Canyon Press, Fence Books, Harper Collins, Holiday House, Macmillan, Milkweed Editions, Penguin Random House, Penguin Young Readers, Simon & Schuster, Simon & Schuster Children's Publishing, Tin House, Workman Publishing, and W.W. Norton. We have a whole set of resources on our website for promoting these books. So do your part and create a display, get some digital media out there, do some social media, about the wonderful authors that you're going to meet tonight. Um, so without further delay, um, I'd like to give it to Larry Law. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Carrie. Um, like Carrie said, uh, this is our first ever uh, Meet the Finalists event, so we're very thrilled tonight. Um, I'm Larry Law. I'm one of the co-directors of Heartland. Um, the award celebration uh, annually is one of our favorite Heartland events, so we wanted to try something new and uh, unique, unique this year, which brings us to our event tonight. Um, you know the books featured in tonight's event, so we wanted an opportunity to get to know the authors, and that's what tonight's event is all about. Um, really quickly, uh, right now, I would like to take a moment to send some love to the Malone family and our friends at Main Street Books in Lafayette, Indiana. Um, some of you have probably heard, uh, but today, Tamsin Malone, who's the owner of Main Street Books, passed away after a hard-fought bat battle with cancer. Um, on a personal note, um, after my dad passed and after Viv was born, uh, Tamsin was one of the first book uh, people to reach out to me. Um, she's a beautiful woman, um, a very enthusiastic bookseller, and someone I always looked forward to seeing at Heartland, so she'll be deeply missed. So please, um, if you have a moment, uh, send some love to the folks at Main Street Books in Lafayette, Indiana. Um, before I bring up the hosts for, for the evening tonight, I'd like to quickly mention a few upcoming Heartland education sessions we have. On Tuesday, September 7th, we have the IPH Masterclass. Friday, September 10th, we have the future of sectioning. Tuesday, September 14th, we have marketing lessons gained from the pandemic. Thursday, September 23rd, we have a social media panel. Tuesday, October 5th, we have don't be intimidated by shelf talkers. And Tuesday, October 12th, we have how to work with your rep in this new age. We'll be announcing a few more sessions soon, so please stay tuned for that. Um, like Carrie said, at the very end of tonight's event, voting will go live for the Heartland Booksellers Award. We'll throw a link into the chat uh, at the end of tonight's event, and that link will also be available on the Heartland Fall Forum website. And now I would like to introduce our host for tonight's event. Um, originally from San Francisco, Ida Cutler has worked for four years as a bookseller at Women and Children First in Chicago, one of the last 12 remaining feminist bookstores in the country. This year, Ida started a very silly new release Tuesday segment for the bookstore's social media. When Ida is not selling, talking about, or reading books, she can be found writing, performing, and teaching with the Chicago Neo Futurist Theater. <clears throat> Shane Mullen is the event coordinator, bookseller, and book whisperer at Left Bank Books in St. Louis. He, he has been an actor, bartender, barista, standardized patient, 
radio DJ and reluctant electrician's assistant. Originally from Missouri, he is a graduate of Truman State University. You cannot follow him on Twitter. So please join me in welcoming the rising star of feminist bookstore social media and our sweet baby boy of Midwest bookselling, Ida Cutler and Shane Mullen. <laughs> wow, thank you. Thank you, Larry and Carrie. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, Shane, it's sort of a disappointing that our names don't rhyme. I, had I know. I know. Oh, what a bummer. But yes, we're excited to be here hosting um, the Heartland Booksellers Award Celebration. Um, I'm Ida. I'm in Chicago right now, um, where I've been a bookseller at the Feminist Independent Bookstore, Women and Children First for the last four years. Um, this is my second time uh, co-hosting the event, so I obviously love it so much. Came back again. Um, and yeah, here I am with Shane P. Mullen. I have to ask, what is the P? everyone wants to know it is my it stands for my grandmother patricia but it is just a p period so yeah, it's very cool and authorly um i think <laughs> um also i was a standardized patient too i didn't know that about you so we can talk about that later um <laughs> but I, what i want to do is i want to explain to everybody watching how tonight is going to work um so the author finalists they were divided into their various categories of nonfiction, poetry picture book young adult middle and middle grade and fiction um then they were divided again within those categories into pairs each author in their pair prepared a question to ask their partner. So they're going to ask these questions and then each author is going to have two, minute, two minutes to answer that question. So it'll be five rounds of this. Um, Shane and I are going to be facilitating the transitions, bringing these author pairs in those categories onto the screen and introducing them by letting you know their names, their pronouns, the title of their book, uh, the publisher, and then those pairs are going to do the question asking. So you can kind of think of this whole night as like a sort of speed dating thing, um, except no one has to take anyone out to an expensive, awkward dinner after this, unless they want to. I um, actually don't know if that's how speed dating works, but that is, uh, that is what you can kind of think of for this. Um, before we get started, I thought Shane and I, um, I thought that we could, ask, we prepared questions to ask each other um, so that you kind of get a feel for how the format is gonna work. So Shane, um, do you wanna ask me a question first? I'll ask you. Yes. One. Okay. All right, so my question for you, Ida. So we are living in a pandemic world. So I'm wondering which genre of fiction world you would want to live in currently. That, good question. Um, I think because it feels so fictional right now, like everything that's been going on for like the past year, like and just so like strange, I feel like I would want to go to some like, simple like maybe like Jane Austen I don't know why Jane Austen sounds simple to me it's actually very complicated but something where you like need like a chaperone and like little details happen with like a glove like a tiny thing happens and it's a big deal rather than like big deal things happening all the time and it feeling like a nightmare um so that's that's my answer for that question good question um Shane my question for you um is St. Louis um, I, I've been a few times, my partner's actually from St. Louis, um, and yeah, and, um, uh, I would like to know if you have a favorite St. Louis author, um, either living or not living, um, that you've read a lot and like. Oh, okay. Um, I thought you were going to ask me which ones I've been reading right now, because honestly, like, I am reading Missouri author Laura McHugh, her new mystery, and I just finished, uh, St. Louis author Laurel K. Hamilton for her new series. Uh, that is the first book of her 41 books that I have read. Um, wow. So yeah, so I can't say that she's a favorite. Um, I mean, she's fantastic, but oh, yeah. which author St. Louis? Um, I'm gonna go with Elsa Hart. Um, Elsa, also a mystery author, uh, was I think one and Agatha last year uh, for the Cabinets of Barnaby Maine. Absolutely just historical fiction, like stunning work. So Very cool, cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, now, 
it, I'm going to have you go ahead and take it, Shane, and yeah. introduce our first round. All right. I am really excited for the first category. The first category is nonfiction adult and a lot of really incredible books. I will announce the uh, nominees and then I will be asking the first question as well. So our nominees tonight are Elsa Washuta, Natasha Trethaway, Matthew Gavin Frank, and Sarah Smarsh. Uh, Alyssa, her, Alyssa's book is White Magic from Tin House Press. Matthew Gavin Frank, his book is The Flight of the Diamond Smugglers from W.W. W. Norton. Sarah Smarsh, her book is She Come By It Natural from Simon and & Schuster. And Natasha Trethaway's book is uh, Memorial Drive. And Natasha is unable to make it this evening. So I will be asking the first question. So Alyssa, oh, and my teleprompter is broken. So I'm gonna have to do the old fashioned thing. Uh, Alyssa, in your essays, you talk about your spiritual journey and relationship to symbols. Living in a time of overwhelming uncertainty and desire for assurance or guidance, is there anything from your journey that you might that you think might help those in their own search of peace and meaning? What was the last last part of what you said? You dropped off. Oh goodness, sorry. Um, is there anything from your journey that you think might help those in their own search of peace and meaning? Oh, I feel like I need the answer to this question because during the last year it's been really hard to find meaning and to hold on to all those things but um you know one thing that always stayed with me through the whole thing you know just trying witchcraft and tarot and obsessing over astrology um you know, those things, my interest in things wanes pretty quickly, but what stayed with me as always working was just remembering that trying to control things was pointless and frustrating and the source of basically all of my anxiety and stress in many areas of life. Um, so, you know, it was the sort of like first big realization I had after I got sober was that, um, you know, spirituality was about giving up control for me and not being, you know, the little God of my universe. Um, I think, you know, since my life is all in this attic right now, it's hard to remember that that's still true. Um, but I think that that was, the, that was the biggest piece that stayed with me um, even after all of those practices, you know, got boring or I moved on to something else. All right, next up, Matthew, I believe you're asking Sarah the first question. Hey, Sarah. Hi, um, Matthew. Hey, so, so here's my question. So in She Come By It Natural, you, you pull off something of, of a magic trick. Um, in using your obsession, if I, I could call it that, with Dolly Parton as a lens through which to shape your examination of so many other issues, from the complicated and myriad natures of regional identity, to various definitions and incarnations of feminism, to poverty, to discrimination, to progressive entrepreneurship, without ever sacrificing your love for Parton herself, and so how do you balance in your writing, in the process of putting the book together, the, the honoring of your primary subject, let's say in this case, Parton herself, with the honoring of the attendant discussions that Parton's life sparked? Thank you for the beautiful question, um, so well worded. I, uh, my, my answer to this question is, is actually a, a, a perfectly parallel answer to um, if you offered the same question about my first book, which is seemingly very different, a memoir talking about my family examining socioeconomic class. Um, and, and then this book, She Come By It Natural, um, perhaps might seem to be a, a celebrity biography, but I'm not a celebrity, celebrity biographer. I, um, as, as you noted, uh, use uh, Dolly's um, uh, persona and 
uh, presence in popular culture as a lens for examining, again, socioeconomic class. And, and with both books, um, you know, I, I was always very clear that my, um, my, my objective was to uh, examine different sorts of power structures in, in this country and, and mostly the ways in which class intersects with other aspects of identity and privilege and disadvantage. Um, and so just as um, my, my first book is called a memoir, but it, it's not like, here are all the craziest things that happened to me, which is a, a somewhat familiar kind of strategy for, for structuring a memoir. Um, it was rather, here are all the aspects of my experience that perhaps show us something about class. And similarly with She Come By It Natural, um, I was always trying to be in service to um, a, a broader broader discussion. And um, Dolly Parton happens to be um, much beloved. So a, a palatable sugar pill entry into um, discussion about, well, I, I should broaden that and to say specifically about the intersection between gender and socioeconomic class. So a slightly different angle on, on what I always do. And now I'm going to ask you a question. Um, so as a journalist, um, I find um, uh, fascination in just the, the way in which writers, nonfictionists land on a specific story within the infinite experience that is our shared reality that, that we, we, and we can carve what, whatever we will from that into these nonfiction stories we tell. Please tell us about like the precise moment. Um, and, and if it, if it, if it can't be whittled down to a moment, then please expand on that. But um, when you discovered this phenomena that I, I don't think previously was, was known um, beyond the, the environment and the realm where it is directly experienced, um, carrier pigeons smuggling diamonds in the, within the context of um, you know, an, an industry known for various sorts of horrors and much reported on in, in different sorts of ways, um, when, when you found, found, tell us about when you found this and knew this was the thing you wanted to write. Yeah, yeah. So, so I had um, heard about the Diamond Coast of South Africa for, for some time. Um, it's in the northwest portion of South Africa, and the Diamond Coast was actually closed off to the general public for the better part of 80 years. Um, it was controlled by, um, you know, the De Beers Corporation and other diamond conglomerates. And when De Beers started withdrawing some of their interests and the doors to some of these previously closed off towns, transgenerationally um, closed off towns, began um, opening to the public for the first time, um, I became innately curious just to see what it was like there, how people interacted, um, folks who were living basically in company imposed isolation. Um, and so I went and I found myself in Port Nalith, South Africa, at a bar one night, um, sitting next to a former diamond diver, a guy named George One Time Moises. And he started telling me about all of these ingenious methods by which people would smuggle diamonds out of the mines, including using train carrier pigeons. And if you attach too many diamonds to a pigeon, um, the bird uh, becomes overloaded with the weight and they lose their natural GPS and they seek relief. So they begin to start landing at random. And so all of these diamond bearing birds started landing at random along the beaches of the Diamond Coast. And the way Moises described it, I just had this image in my head of gem laden pigeons raining from the sky. Um, and it was an image that I couldn't get out of my head. And it was precisely that image that um, kind of was the springboard into writing the book. I couldn't shake it. And I just started scratching and scratching and scratching at it to find out what else it may mean and what else it could tell us about ourselves. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, Ida, I believe we are ready for the poetry. Next though. round. Yes, that was wonderful. Thank you all so much. Now we are in round two, poetry. Um, in this category, it, uh, we're already breaking the form um, because there are no even pairs. So now it's just gonna be a chain of questions that guess, get asked, but I'm going to introduce um, our authors 
Um, so in our poetry category, we have Beth Roberts with her book, Like You, published by Fence Books. We have Moheb Soleiman with his book, Homes, published by Coffee House Press. Nate and Nate Marshall with Finn, published by Random House. Um, so there, the chain is going to start, uh, starting with Beth, if you want to take it away. Yes. Breaking the form. It's not a bad thing. Um, well, I have, I have a question for you. Um, and it could have a yes or no answer, like I said, but I think you could talk about it. So your work thrills me on many levels. Um, one is my personal experience of consistently trying to enter nature and feel part of it. I live in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, pretty close to Lake Superior, surrounded by wilderness, um, only about 311,000 other people. Um, so you know what this is like because of the work that you've done. And your description of the Great Lakes region as a borderland and one that is porous, I think is so uh, apt and so good. And you also have pointed out that poetry itself plays with the blurring of many boundaries. Um, and as we know, when experiencing a perfectly, any perfectly dreamy natural setting, um, we experience those borders, those multiple borders between being human uh, and the rest of the natural world. And, and perhaps another question might be whether humans are, are natural or unnatural, but it's another question. So my question to you is, um, does writing poetry, does the writing, the act of it, bring you closer to nature? Or that is, uh, does writing your particular poems allow you to blur boundaries between you yourself as a human and the natural world um, seeping into your work? Wow, um, thank you very much for that really thoughtful question. I feel like I need to like set a timer so I can try to keep this answer within two minutes. Um, I feel like, you know, for me, that's a really complicated question in part because, um, well, like a lot of this book actually came together through some on-site writing um, because it it was really so much of a travel log in a way. Um, you know, I, I kind of really tried to embrace the idea of just writing on whatever, wherever I was when I was really kind of immersed in some of these, you know, natural cultural borderlands. Um, so, you know, in a way, I feel like the answer is a big, huge yes, you know, that being able to kind of just take some time and try to be present in a place and render it or capture something from it, um, you know, of course, would, you know, allow it to really kind of, to me, have like a more authentic, you know, um, just representation in, in, in this writing or in poetry. But, you know, at the same time, I feel like I really do feel so frustrated sometimes with language and, you know, just how every word is, you know, I mean, definitive. Um, and, you know, maybe if I had been a different kind of artist, you know, I would have been coming up with some very abstract music or something that um, I feel like could actually be much more, um, you know, in tune with some of the, you know, just how we really push ourselves um, to kind of encounter, you know, the non-human living world, um, which is a non-linguistic, you know, kind of encounter. So, um, I guess, you know, I kind of have really come in and out of uh, appreciating poetry as far as, you know, nature is concerned. Um, but I think at the same time, uh, it to me is a really wonderful form because it's so associative and, you know, it really kind of just doesn't need logic to kind of hold together. Um, and it can, you know, just really render without necessarily always having to mean something all the time. So, um, yeah but I appreciate that question. <laughs> um, okay, I think I need to switch gears here um, and speak to you, Nate. Such a pleasure to speak to you. Hello. Um, good. You know, I, I have a very personal like stake in the question too, in the same way that Beth did. Um, you know, Chicago to me is like uh, this larger than life place in this huge sprawling region. And, um, you know, I'm so curious the, the place for you that Chicago plays in Finna. Um, and I mean, th that question is really just basic. Like, I'd love to just hear you talk about Chicago, but um, you know, of course it really shows up in the book too, a lot. Um, and uh, so, you know, I just wonder, you know, kind of where is this place in the whole 
you know, not narrative of the book, but, you know, just in, in all that it represents or, you know, maybe in a really personal way, you just feel like it really informs the way that you approach writing or poetry. I'm just going to leave that right there for you to pick whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, that's, yeah, okay, word. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. And I'm gonna, so I wanna, I wanna, I'm gonna try to answer it and then I'm going to sort of try to use it to bridge into my question for Beth. Um, I think, I mean, obviously Chicago is like important in the work and is definitely a thing that shows up and is kind of a, a repeating trope. And for me, it's because I'm just like fascinated by the city. I'm fascinated by place, period, but but in particular Chicago because um, because it means so many different things, right? And because it is the sort of like contested space um, that perhaps all cities are. Um, and so, you know, so I think about what Chicago may have meant for my grandparents and great grandparents who migrated there from the South, right? And who perhaps saw it as a kind of refuge, right? and how that might have changed over generations, what it means for me now as someone who's not living in Chicago, um, but very much still like has a relationship to the city. And so, so I don't know, I think I write about Chicago so much and it shows up so much because, well, two reasons. One, because I, because I, I just remain fascinated by, by the kind of symbol of, of the city or the symbol of place. And then I think also, um, how can I say this? Um, also because, you know, even so much of our sort of media landscape, and we could talk about, you know, publishing in this respect, but we could also, we could talk about anything. So much of our media landscape and imagination, I think in this country is so defined by the coast, right? It's so defined by sort of New York and Los Angeles and perhaps the Bay Area, et cetera, et cetera. But I just like, think it's sort of like, cool and interesting to like put on for the myth the, you know like yeah and it's and it's so funny too because even like coming from a like a sort of midwestern context Chicago in so many ways exists as as that kind of cultural behemoth but then once you get outside of the midwest it's like oh that I don't know anything about that place I've never been there um and so yeah I, I, I just I like I have a lot of questions right I think I I know a lot of random stuff about Chicago and it's not and I think I have learned those things mostly as a way of like trying to answer questions that I have, like lingering questions. Um, and so I'm gonna use this to kind of bridge over to you, Beth. I was thinking, um, so my, I was so struck by the book, right? And and one of the things that I, I kept thinking about is the way that you're using memory as a, as like a kind of source material, right? But um, But the book is sort of framed with this notion of like anti-nostalgia. Um, which I, which I'm like, which I'm so kind of into, right? And in part, cause, cause, you know, when, when I think about place, right? Pl I don't think I can really extract place from time, right? Um, and so I, I guess like, if you could talk more about this notion of anti-nostalgia um, as you see it, or as you see it sort of enacting in your work and, and, and like you. Yeah, I, I'm captured by that phrase, anti-nostalgia, I hadn't thought of that um, until very recently. And I, I guess it is true that if it is anti-nostalgic, then it's because I think that nostalgia doesn't answer any questions or solve any problems. And I think that my main, um, one of, not my main, one of my um, efforts when it comes to poetry, one of the reasons why I write poetry at all is because I want to use it to answer some questions that I have. I have questions, you guys, and I don't know how to answer them. And I think poetry is a very interesting way to try to, um, if not solve problems, at least, um, or even answer questions, at least to ask the questions so that maybe others, you know, you dear readers might pick them up and help me out with this or help out the rest of us with this. And so I, 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 I have, I, it, the book is divided into three sections. And I think that you know, the first section is more personal and maybe that one relies the most on nostalgia um, to try to launch me into some better questions and some new answers. The middle section uh, concerns this human animal chimera and that one, the questions are more obvious. The questions are regarding um, ethics, I suppose, and 
speaking of um, non-humans, more than humans and humans, um, what is that? Who are we and um, how can we fix these things that make us human? Um, the last section is just a little last section from the point of view of the skull for some reason. But um, yeah, did I answer your question in there somewhere, Nate? I just was going off on a thing. Was there another question? Was that an answer? Again, see, I, I just use it to ask more questions. I think that worked. I, I don't know. I felt like an answer to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> was that good? Are we done? <laughs> that was fantastic. That was really right. stunning answers. So thank you. Uh, the next category that we have for the evening is picture book. So I will announce the nominees and then we will do the questions. The first nominee is Ambreen Tar Tariq uh, for her book, Fatima's Great, uh, Great Outdoors from Penguin Random House. Molly Beth Griffin, her book is 10 Beautiful Things from Charles, Brid Charles Bridge Pub Publishing. Then we have Cosby A. Cabrera. Her book is Me and Mama from Simon & Schuster Children's Publishing. And last, we have Philip C. Stead and Matthew Cordell, the author and illustrator of Follow That Frog from Holiday House. And Breen will be asking uh, Molly, Beth, Molly Beth questions and vice versa. And Cosby will be asking Philip and Matthew questions. Hi, hi everyone. I was just typing a how on brand for the poetry category right when we transitioned. Your answers were brilliant and very poetic. Um, it is such an honor to join you all today. I am so excited. Um, I'm not a career children's book author, so this is such an incredible journey for me. And it lends itself into the question I'm going to ask Molly, which is, as I've written my whole life, I absolutely love writing. It's how I've coped with life. But the journey of writing a children's book has made me appreciate the skill that it takes to build out characters and explore complicated issues for children. So my question for you, Molly, is in that vein, who was most influential for you in crafting your main character, Lily? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a great question. And um, it's funny because this book took about a dozen years between writing and publishing. So although I, I now have an eight-year-old and a 12-year-old, this character was created before my children were born. So um, it's not based on them. It's much more about me as a child and my um, memories of road trips as a child. Um, so we, I grew up in Minnesota and have a lot of relatives in Colorado. So we would several times a year drive from Minnesota to Colorado. And I would sit in the back seat in between my big brother and my big sister and for long, you know, long days of that. And um, I remember my mom making up car games and to pass the time and to keep us entertained and probably to stop us complaining all the time. So this book ended up being about a car game where they're, uh, Lily and her grandma are looking for 10 beautiful things along the way to their new house. And um, it just came from all those trips where we played I Spy and we played car bingo and all of those things where um, my mother was really saying, look, at the world and appreciate it. We're driving past, you may as well look. And so I'm hoping that um, I do that for my kids now that I have my own kids. And I'm hoping that the book will do that or encourage that in the reader as well. So that's sort of where, where she came from. I don't know if that answers that, but <laughs> that's, that's kind of where it came from for me all those years ago um, when it was new. And my question for you has to do with those outdoor spaces in the world and falling in love with them, because I know that that is what you do as well. And I wanted to ask you what your favorite outdoor space was when you were a kid. And if that place 
or your relationship to that place um, inspired the book or was um, informed the book or made its way into this first children's book that you wrote? Um, I, I'm smiling so wide while you're answering your question because my book is about this character, Fatima, who actually is based on me. Uh, it, it's my middle name, but it's also a name I chose because it's important in so many different cultures so that a lot of different children and communities could relate to it. But um, the story is about Fatima's road trip to the campsite because that's what we did. And when we moved to the United States, we moved to Minnesota and you know, my, we were struggling immigrants and we um, we took road trips as our form of entertainment. And to me, the outdoors was the road trip leading to the outdoors. It was the start of it. So it's a really interesting concept in space for me because being an immigrant and the book explores this really is Fatima's transition and Fatima's family's transition into the United States. But it's not the immigrant story about the struggles during her life, it's the reprieve from those struggles that happens in the outdoors. And for the first time, for Fatima, the outdoors is where she gets to be a child and her sister gets to be a child, right? Not having to deal with the struggles. And that really is my sister and I and my parents. We got to see my parents be joyful for a moment and we all got to be curious and we all got to learn uh, without high risks of our daily grind while my parents are working two jobs and my sister and I are dealing with bullying and a lot of like social trauma. Um, so the outdoor space that means the most to me is the space of memory, which is so funny because I think one of the great poets on our panel said it about extracting place and time. And that's something that my book is all about fusing together it's building together Fatima's memories of what was difficult and what stopped in the outdoors. And the outdoors became extremely special to her for that reason. And so uh, the space that's important to me is the space that my family occupied in the outdoors and not necessarily outdoors. And that's what created that joy, the sort of really warm memories that I go back to and warm my hands against over and over. And it is what formulated my love for the outdoors and what it can mean. So um, like everybody else, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> and I guess we next... should just take over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> okay, who wants to go first? Sure. Why don't I, I jump in? Um, thank you for sharing that, Ambreen and Molly and, I, I'm so anxious to pick up uh, Fatima's Great Outdoors. I haven't uh, seen it just yet, um, but I did catch 10 uh, beautiful things, Molly, and, um, and absolutely loved it. Um, it's just really amazing that there's a reframing that occurs throughout the journey, like, you know, how she starts off with her grandmother, you know, and then how they end their trip finally arriving at home. Um, so I have a question for Philip and Matthew. Uh, thanks for being here today. And um, I wanted to, for you to talk a little bit about Follow That Frog. It reminds me a great deal of the intonality, um, a bit um, of uh, Mark Twain's advice to little girls um, that sort of presumes the intelligence of this child reader, you know, as this story is unfolding. Um, and there's um, like just a really sweet symbiosis between the text and the pictures. And you're both um, very uh, strong storytellers in your own right, um, author illustrators. And Philip, I know you're married to Aaron, who's also an illustrator. Um, so my curiosity is how did, um, how did your working uh, together uh, come about your meeting and, and deciding to work together. And one thing I do notice about your books is um, they, they are in fact rich with emotional um, intelligence and uh, they stir the heart and the imagination. So curious about how this came about. You wanna take it, Matt? No, I'll jump on. Uh, sure, um, <clears throat> well, Phil and I have been friends for a long time 
and uh, we've done this is our third book, right? This is our third book together, third and book, yeah. uh, I, you know, the stories that we've done, I think we connect a lot about the the type of stories that we do together. You know, there's sort of a strangeness to our stories that we do together, but there's also some. Uh, there's like a, you know, there's a lot of heart as well. So um, Bill does that really well, I think. And and I think, you know, when we first became friends, Phil connected with me, I think, because of my illustration style, which I think ha lends itself to both of those attributes as well. Um, but uh, Mark Twain, it's interesting you mentioned Mark Twain because Phil has a, he has a, a direct I don't know if you knew but Phil has a direct connection to Mark Twain we're both fans of Mark Twain but Phil has a cooler story about Mark Twain uh yeah yeah a couple years ago I was actually asked to finish an, an unfinished Mark Twain text which is one of the weirdest requests I've ever had in my entire life and and probably one that I shouldn't have said yes to um to answer your question, I think, uh, so Matt and I really connected on the, on, on so many levels creatively, like we're just sort of interested in the same sort of books, we're interested in the same sort sorts of music, uh, we make each other laugh. Um, and so we have sort of an unusual relationship in that authors and illustrators don't typically, you know, even speak to one another when they make a book, but Matt and I are constantly talking to each other. I mean, even just today, we were texting back and forth about, you know, bands that we like and or don't like, or whatever. Um, and so there's just a real sort of symbiotic relationship uh, between us when we make books. I like working with Matt because I can make slightly different kinds of books than I can make uh, if I'm doing the illustration or if my wife Erin is doing the illustration. I think there's a, a theme of, of kindness or um, quietness that sort of runs through almost all the books I do. But with Matt, I also get to um, put a little bit of I guess I describe it as righteous indignation. Um, the characters really get to like have a sense of justice that I don't really get to explore in my other books. And, and that's one of the reasons I love working with Matt. Um, to ask you a question. Uh, so I, I should say that uh, your book, Me and Mama, this was the first book that my wife Erin brought home from an actual bookstore once we were allowed back inside of bookstores and she was so excited to show it to me she thought that the writing and she was she was right about this the writing is just fantastic in this book we love we love your writing in this book um so initially I was wondering like did you consider yourself a writer first before you were an artist because the writing is so confident and then as I learned more about you I see that you're also a you know fashion designer and quilt maker doll maker and all these very sort of personal and handmade art forms that you're comfortable with and I'm just wondering what came first um, like, what did you love doing when you were 10 years old? And, and what, what came after, you know, there's usually one thing that leads to the next, that leads to the next. And how did you become a bookmaker, I guess? Oh, I'll try to do that in less than two minutes. <laughs> but um, yeah, and, and also I have to say thank you for that uh, character of great aunt Josephine. She's just really hysterical. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I, I was what you might consider a secret writer. You know, I remember there's like this little uh, interview that my dad, you know, was asking all of uh, my siblings and myself, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, you know, I was telling him what I was studying in school. And, and then I slipped in that I, I wrote. And then um, he said, oh, uh, you, you take writing as if it were a subject, but I, I was trying to tell him, well, I, I actually write. And so like, that's the kind of thing that nobody necessarily knew about me unless you might've received a letter from me. Um, you know, and it was only my husband who knew because there were bins upon bins of material you know, that just traveled from place to place you know, as we moved um, around in our many years of, of marriage. Um, so, so the writing was secret, um, and then all of what is visual, you know, there was no way that I could hide that, you know, that just showed up. Um, so that's what maybe people knew about uh, first. Um, I don't know if that answers the question in less than two minutes. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> 
<laughs> so nice to hear all of this. Um, so now moving right along, we have our next category. Our next um, category is young adult and middle grade. Um, so we have pair number one, which is Angeline uh, Bully, and who is the writer of The Firekeeper's Daughter from Macmillan, with Jacqueline Woodson, writer of Before the Ever After from Penguin Young Readers. And then pair number two is Amy, Amy Timberlake, uh, with her book is Skunk and Badger from Workman, and Nettie Okorafor, her book, uh, Ikenga, Penguin Random House. Take it away, Angeline. Oh, what an honor to uh, be here with everyone tonight and especially with Jacqueline Woodson. Uh, so um, Jacqueline and I are similar in age. However, we're at the opposite ends of the spectrum regarding our careers. Uh, my debut came out in May, uh, March of this year and she is has a long and honored career, uh, middle grade, picture book, young adult, uh, triple threat all the way around. Um, and so I'll start off the question by asking uh, Jacqueline, with this illustrious career, um, with middle grade, your latest book, it touches on something that's so important. Um, and a different, you know, the novel in verse and dealing with um, athletes and the impact in families and things that we don't think of when we are cheering on our favorite teams. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I wanted to talk to you about the topic of your book, but also speak to your career and what changes you've seen in publishing over this career and your book and where it is now, maybe even what you see coming uh, hmm. in publishing. And just uh, again, such an honor to be here with you. Well, the honor is mine. I love the, um, the um, excitement that your book is getting and the well-deserved accolade. So I'm honored to be here with you, with all of you. And it's, I, I'm just always so psyched to be in this world of young people's literature and, um, and watch the changing, the changes coming and, and, the, um, and watch myself grow old in it, which is amazing. So I think um, the, thing, the thing that I've seen change the most is representation in young people's literature. When I was coming um, into the world in the 90s, it was, you know, the bodega doors had opened and a few of us were able to get through. And, and then thanks to organizations like We Need Diverse Books and the push, I mean, I came, I came on the heels of Virginia Hamilton and Walter Dean Myers and, um, and the McKissicks and those writers. And then I came in with um, Rita Williams Garcia and and those guys, but to, to just watch the traction that um, young people's literature is getting and also watch, um, see so many brilliant novels and um, picture books and, you know, YA novels um, coming out and all the stories that had so, for so many years been silenced in the world of literature, um, getting that shine and that breath. And, you know, I think of, Firekeeper's Daughter, and you published a book during a pandemic, and it's gotten all of these incredible accolades, so kudos, because I think, I think there are some real challenges, but I've also seen um, it, it change in that when I was coming up, people, you know, look down on young people's literature, and I think that's changed a lot, and of course, that's thanks to some of the more anyway, I won't, I won't go on, because I know I only have two, two minutes, and in terms of, um, Oh, those are my sorority colors, pink and green. Um, but in terms of um, um, before the ever after and writing about CTE and writing about um, the impact of um, um, sports like football on black and brown bodies, I felt like it was just time. It was just time to talk about the way that an American pastime 
was really taking its toll in the same way that mass incarceration and you know police brutality are taking tolls on our black and brown bodies. I, I, I remember listening recently to Marshawn Lynch talk about you know, take care of your mental, take care of your chicken, which is your money, but really talking about the fact that CTE chronic, um, I can't, I can't believe I'm blanking on, but, but CTE is real. Um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a real thing and has a real impact long after football season is over. So thank you for that question. And now I get to ask you a question, right? And so my question to you, given, your book, which I, is absolutely beautiful and so important and goes to so many places. I think too that um, not a lot of people were going to back in the early days <laughs> in terms of thinking about family and sexual abuse and violence and, and love and, and um, mortality and all these different, um, and even the issue of biraciality. Like I think those are some of the um, conversations that weren't being had had too often in young people's literature. So I want to know, as a debut novelist, what has been very surprising and what has not been surprising as for you as an author? And you can answer it in either order. Okay. Uh, to get asked a question by you, I'm just fangirling, sorry. <laughs> um, what's not been surprising? are the times when Native women have come up to me at book signings and other in-person events, or they've reached out to me through direct message on my social media, and they let me know that, that I got it right, that yeah. they felt seen in my story um, for the first time. And sometimes when I do a book signing and they're like the first one, like we were all in our masks and this uh, young woman came up to me and I could just see it in her eyes. Um, like she didn't even have to, she couldn't come up with the words and, um, but I could see it exactly in her eyes, what the story meant to her. And it was everything I'd hoped for. And so that was, I guess, like a, I wasn't surprised, but I was so thankful for that. Um, the surprising reaction has been the number of people who are not Native who have responded to the book um, and to the issues that have been addressed in the book um, and that they could identify with things or that it completely changed what they thought they knew about Native communities. Uh, and that I think has been the most surprising because I really wanted to write a book that would have the widest impact possible, but I knew it was such a specific story too. And then the whole thing of in the specific, there is the universal. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's been the pleasant surprise is realizing the truth in that, in that writing a story that was so specific to my tribal community that it touched a chord with so many people who have never read a story by a Native author before or really had no idea about contemporary Native life. Um, that's been the, the pleasant surprise in all of this. So yeah. great question. Thank you for writing it. I think it's I oh am I still can you hear me mm -hmm. yeah all right good <laughs> um I think it's my turn so I need to ask Nettie a question mm -hmm. and so I read an interview with you with you somewhere on the web okay <laughs> and uh, and it's it, where you said you had um, you okay. Where that said, um, you had surgery as a teen, mm -hmm. and it led to you becoming a writer. And it just fascinated me, and I would love to hear more about it. <laughs> oh boy, um, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's like the the very reason why I became a writer was this uh, was based in this um, 
incidents. And I have two minutes to summarize that. And that is really hard to do. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. That's hard. Um, I did write a, a, a brief memoir called broken places in outer spaces that, that, goes into all of this because, um, yeah, my journey to becoming a writer was kind of unique. I was an athlete, you know, I was, I played semi-pro tennis from the age of nine to 19. And I also was a track star. My parents were track stars. My sisters were, were athletes as well. We were like the Venus and Serena before Venus and Serena. So like we, we saw the United States through tennis. And so, um, but the thing about, te the thing about tennis for me was that it was dominant. My game was dominated by the by one side of my body. I had a killer forehand and a killer serve. I could hit 114 mile per hour serve, and um, and so that kind of threw things off. So to make a long story short, um, even though I was doing all of these sports, I was diagnosed with scoliosis when I was 13, which is normal. But my scoliosis was crazy scoliosis. It was really severe. It progressed really fast. Um, and so by the time I was a freshman in college. Um, and m mind you, at this time, I thought I was going to be a veterinarian or an entomologist. I wanted to study bugs. Uh, by the time I was a freshman in college, they took an x-ray and they were like, you know, we need to, you, this, this is getting worse. This is only going to get worse. You're going to have a shortened life. By the time you're 25, you're going to be crippled. Um, we need to do surgery on this to straighten it out. Went in to have the surgery after my freshman year. I was on the tennis team at University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana and went in to have that surgery that summer and woke up nine hours later, paralyzed from the waist down. There's a 1% <sighs> chance of paralysis. And I was in that 1%. And that 1% reacts mysteriously to this surgery, to straightening it out. They don't know why. They don't know if you're ever going to walk again. And so I went from being the super athlete to being in a hospital bed. And so that was, and before that, I'd never written anything creatively at all. I had, uh, you know, I was very science and math oriented. But when I was stuck in that bed, it kicked something into into action. The only the only hint was that I loved reading. I, and this kind of leads <laughs> me into my question to you. But I, I loved reading. Um, and anything that had a good story, I would read that was the only hint that I would be doing mm -hmm. what I'm doing today. So and once I started writing in that hospital bed, I didn't stop. I just it was like I discovered the thing, you know, that thing I discovered it mm -hmm. in that moment, you know, in that moment of darkness. So that's how I arrived at becoming a writer. I ended up changing my major and I just haven't, I haven't stopped writing ever since then. So, so that was how, um, that was how I became a writer. But like, like I said, one of the things about when I was growing up, I loved reading when I was on, when I wasn't on the tennis court or the track, it was the library, you know, the library where I was just discovering everything and I wouldn't pay attention to categories. And I naturally migrated towards books that did not have human characters, especially, you know, so I grew up reading, yeah, they, this is the transition, but I grew up reading Frog and Toad in particular, Frog and Toad and the Moomins, and I loved those, those narratives, you know, and I, there was something highly relatable about, about these stories that, you know, where the, the main characters were not human beings. I just, for some reason, really, really related strongly to that kind of narrative. And, um, and even, even today, like still, I, I revisit those, I, I look to those kinds of books. So even as an adult, I read those, I love them. So um, that leads me to my, my question for you with Skunk and Badger, which is just such a delight. Um, I oh, wanted to know- Alert from calendar. Oh my gosh, shut up, and shut up. Okay. Um, <laughs> I can hear you talk to me. Every all of my stuff talks to me here, so I knew something was going to interrupt the moment I speak. But anyway, so uh, my question to you is, you know, how what was your process like? Because I wanted to I wanted to ask you a, a process question because um, I'm always interested in the process. Uh, every writer's writing process because it's always different. It's always interesting. What was your process like? Uh, writing this narrative and also what was your research like and did it include researching specifically skunks and badgers? It didn't include researching <laughs> skunks and badgers. Sorry that I've lost my light. I, I'm getting darker and darker in the in the in the murk. But anyway, um, yeah, it did not include researching skunk and badger. I was trying to write a different story uh, that had a 
it was a, it was going to probably be a middle grade thing, realistic, and I had a young character in it who read books about bears. So I went to the library. I checked out every picture book with bears, and I read um, and all the classics. So I read Winnie the Pooh and um, Paddington Bear, and I read bear mythology and everything like that. And when I when I read Winnie the Pooh, I I was really struck by how well it was crafted. Just those little they were just little nuggets, you know. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I actually really fell for Winnie the Pooh when I was a kid, but it wasn't until I was I was doing this, reading all these bear stories that I really fell for how these stories were crafted. So I thought, well, what would it be like, Amy, you know, if you wrote a story like that? I'd never thought about the writing what I called, now I call it animals and sweaters, writing animal and sweater stories since John Clausen did it and he put them in sweaters and they're so cute. So I was like, oh, they're animals in sweaters. But I had never really thought about writing a talking animal thing. But then I had read these Winnie the Pooh and I thought they're episodic, they're, they're perfect little nuggets. And what would it be like if you wrote one of those? And it wouldn't be writing Winnie the Pooh, it would be you with your sense of humor and the way you see the world and, you know, what, what would that, what would that just look like? It was like a writing exercise for me. I, I wasn't, cause I actually wasn't at all sure that there was any market for this. I just thought, I just want to see what would happen if this kind of story came out of me and how would I do it? Um, it was, it was pretty interesting in the sense that I, I I have actually felt like I'm very revealing in my realistic fiction. I that I you know that I'm pretty much taking my exoskeleton, splitting it down the middle. I've been thinking a lot about animals, so recently I'm now I'm thinking about exoskeletons. It just comes out. You start everything is an animal. So you know I, I feel like in realistic fiction I'm I'm pretty revealing, but I have to say that. Uh, writing uh, writing animals in sweaters and just letting your sense of humor be out there is uh is a pretty vulnerable spot and it's been really fun it was super it's super fun i'm really enjoying it but I, when i when i finish something and send it off i think oh my goodness what is i mean what have i done like I, I don't know if, it, you know, like, uh, is it funny? I hope it's funny. Holy smokes, I hope it's funny. If it's not funny, oh my gosh. <laughs> so it just feels so vulnerable. So there you go. I think I answered the question, kind of? Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. That was really incredible. And just to see like everyone fan fanning out on everyone else, I love it. Uh, believe it or not, we are at the final round. Uh, this is our fiction round. Uh, we have first up Alice Randall for Black Bottom Saints from Amistad Press, Harper Collins, with Chris Harding Thornton, Pickard County Atlas from MCD Picador uh, McMillan. Then we will have Brian Washington for Memorial from Riverhead Books, Penguin Random House, with Diane Wilson, The Seed Keeper, from Milkweed Editions. And thank you all so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think I get to kick it off by asking the quite brilliant Chris Harding Thornton a question. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I will just say that in that fangirling, we may be two of the only artists on here tonight who also have a career in the world of music. So I truly appreciate being with you. I'm gonna start with a quote from you, tiny one. Singer machine ready to go in front of her. She was pinching, pinning an iron on denim patch in the crotch of Rick's work jeans. Three chords and the truth. Literary country music. Starting with the title, Pickard County Atlas, you clearly indicate, Chris, that you 
that place will play an important role in this novel. Nebraska. Tell us a bit about how Nebraska moves into and impacts the lives of your characters, your relation to Nebraska, and how you made the decision to convey Nebraska through the interior of homes, the exteriors of cars, and the rhythms of your language. Wow. Those are those are huge questions. Uh, <laughs> I don't I don't know if I can do them any justice. Uh, Nebraska. I don't think it was a choice so much. It was just it, sometimes when I sit down to write, there's some place and time I want to be in, and I think the characters just like come out of whatever that place and time is. Um, Nebraska is a really complicated place. Uh, I'm sure most people actually do know that, but I think it gets sort of reduced a bit. Um, you know, people have been talking about uh, getting a lot of news from the coasts and things like that, you know, and it's being flyover country. And I think, you know, a lot of people think lives are simple, I, I guess, in a place like Nebraska. And it's just you know, no life is simple. It's, you know, if, I mean, if you're dealing, especially I think with um, economic instability, which the characters are definitely dealing with and having to make choices like major life choices, like whether or not you're gonna be a parent or not because of economic instability and things like this. Um, I think that kind of dictated, uh, that kind of dictated it. I think the sound the music thing, it's like, I there there has to be a certain, and I never really know until I'm writing in a voice, but there has to be a certain number of syllables in each sentence and then in each paragraph. And so I think that that was, it's always like trying to balance, like getting the image right while trying to get the, the music there and the sound in there, if that makes sense. Absolutely, um, you do it so well. Thank you so much. Coming from you, that is pretty freaking amazing. Uh, uh, did, I think I probably blew two minutes up there. Um, I I really would love to ask you about Black Bottom Saints. Uh, it's it's rhapsodic. Um, the the structure of the book. It's like you could. I mean, it's like a book of saints. You which. I am familiar with and so like you could pick any point uh, out of the book and read it or you can read it just straight through um it's a brilliant structure that's not really a question but i i do wonder how you did how you i mean that's such a risk to take but i also really desperately want to ask you um it felt like you'd done so much research and you discovered these, all of these people who are not even mentioned in footnotes who are so incredibly important historically. And it, I mean, we start and we're in Detroit and we're in Detroit when it's at Detroit, you know? Um, I feel like it's so important that it shows that, that history is not this like this this series of progressive like great things happening. You know what I mean? I don't know. Anyway, my question to you then is like, how do you? Number one, the structure. I would like to know how you decided on that structure. But then number two, I would like to also know if I can be greedy. Um, how you hope that reverberates like being like showing like Detroit from the 30s to the 60s and showing these people who should not be footnotes. I love both of those questions. I the structure is a Saints Day book crossed with a cocktail book. I have this that every single chapter ends with a actual historical African American cocktail. Um, because in a novel that really does deal with public and private trauma, but takes as its central theme, joy is radical. Yeah. I give people a, a way to celebrate a five cents address to joy at the each end of each chapter. So that's the sight, the sound, the scent, the taste, the touch of joy in that cocktail. Um, I love 
it, I was born in Detroit in 1959 and Detroit is the epicenter of this novel, but I think this conversation with you is a wonderful place to note that the 61 saints, they all come through Detroit and the Gotham Hotel and many of them spend a lot of time, but I can put a saint in every single state of the Midwest. Some of them um, live say in St. Louis for, uh, this is Reverend Cook. Uh, one of my very favorite saints, Laverne. This is Laverne Baker. Uh, Laverne Baker is the second woman to ever go into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and people don't talk about her. But I love thinking about her when she was Little Miss Sharecropper. When she would get on the same stage with Billie Holiday would get on in Silk, she would do it in actual overalls and a woven hat because she didn't want to forget the people left behind in Mississippi but she was doing that in Chicago. She was born in Chicago. So the Midwest, this book is a celebration of Detroit, but it is a, it is a complete celebration of the Midwest and these people, artists, and some bartenders you know, who are migrating. Thomas Bullock, who gave me the other part of the form of this. He was a bartender in Kentucky, in Louisville. He was a bartender in St. Louis. He was shaking up taste and visual metaphors, but never recognizes an artist, though he will publish a book of cocktails. It's also a book of poems. It's literally, his recipes are poems. And he publishes that around 1916. And he gets largely forgotten. And if he's remembered a little bit, people forget that Bricktop owned her own bar in Mexico City, in Rome and in Paris. And this is a black woman. So this is a celebration of the Midwest and it is, it's gritty, but it always moves to joy. And that's where I am at 62 years old in novel five. I said, this is the one it took me half a century of living and four first novels to get to, to figure out how to wrestle that trauma to the ground and embrace the joy. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Country music on you. <laughs> Hi, Diane, it's an honor to get to ask you a question and to get to talk to you. And mine is two questions masquerading as one question, but it's it's not terribly long, but in The Sea Keeper, we move between voices, we move between generations, and we move between contexts, between people that they have and the relationships they have with one another, and also the relationships that they have to the land. So my question is, over the course of writing the book, did you feel that you learned new things about how you conceived of community and the role that community can hold? And also what was it like weaving each of these voices and each of these communities across time and also across context into one single, really vibrant, really full tapestry altogether? Mm, God, that, what a great question. Thank you, Brian. It's really, it's really terrific to be in conversation with you tonight. And I'm, I'm feeling a little pressure as we're the last pair, like, you know, <laughs> bring it on in. <laughs> um, but thank you for asking about um, the way that community builds in um, throughout the Seed Keeper through the different voices. And I think, um, I think that was really one of the really important transitions during the book that I was trying to make with with each character um, because the book is so much about relationship. It's a relationship um, in particular that they have um, to the land and then the seeds themselves that are one of the characters in the book um, are also serve as a metaphor so that it's a way of exploring what does that relationship mean? How has it changed? What does that consequence mean for us? What does it mean for all of the um, everything that lives with us, plants and animals. And, um, and so through that, through that transformative process of building community, then you see these, you see these characters. It's, it's actually, I, I feel like that's the struggle that we're all in, you know, and that um, native communities where there has been so much assimilation across generations that really what we're trying to do is find our way back to community. And, and so for the main character, um, Rosalie Ironwing, her journey is 
from the farthest edge of where assimilation has taken her family over these many generations. And through her, um, through her, uh, through her relationship with seeds, it's actually those seeds that are bringing her home. And, and so that's, that was what I was trying to convey is that we have this relationship with the world around us that um, I think we so take for granted. So that when everything, all these terrible things have been happening in the last year from a pandemic and then the aftermath after George Floyd's murder when the Twin Cities, I live just north of the Twin Cities when they were you know, when there was so much violence and fires and, and just pain and then everything that came after that, I could walk outside and, and be in a different world. I could see the gifts that those seeds were bringing. I could see a flight of geese flying overhead and they didn't care what was going on mm -hmm. with human beings. And, and so it's a, it's a reminder of there's all kinds of ways that we can build community and there's all kinds of ways that we can embrace our relationships um, with other with uh, other beings from mm. seeds to plants and animals. So, so thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, wow. And it kind of brings me around to, um, so what, what really fascinated me in your book, which, um, You've described as a love story, and I love that, that you bring that right out. And, and to me, part of that love story was with food. And I so relate to that, you know? And it seems to me that the, that, that love story with food, it's both, um, you know, the ways in which we can use food just to create uh, very beautiful scenes and visceral details and, and action. But there's also very complex ways in which food shows relationships between characters. It even shows, um, it can tell us a lot about both race and class in the way that food is expressed um, throughout your book. So I'm just wondering, I have kind of an open-ended question. Um, just if you would talk about how you developed food as such an important theme in your book, and then kind of um, just share with us a little bit about your personal relationship, um, maybe with cooking and food and, you know. Yeah, of course. The, the latter is a bit easier. I'm a big fan of food, you know, have been for a while now. Um, and I think that from the outset of writing Memorial, I knew, very, I knew that it would hinge very much that love story between these two queer cis young men who are coming from communities of color who personally perhaps don't have models or maps or frameworks for the sort of relationship that they found themselves within and this question of how does one provide care when they perhaps aren't able to articulate what care means to them, when they can feel their way around it, maybe, when they can intuit what their wants and desires are or may be, but if they don't quite have the vocabulary for it, right? If there are certain gestures, if there are certain words, if there are certain actions that are mix missing from like the respective lexicons, like how do they provide care to the folks that they really do care about? Pretty early on in the drafting process, food was an impulse that felt as if so structurally it made sense, but also emotionally that it made sense. And because the primary relationship in Memorial is between these two young men, one of them, Ben, is a character who begins the novel without any culinary vocabulary to speak of for whom someone, you know, scrambled eggs is just like big fucking masterpiece, like you cannot imagine doing it. And yet, his journey is one in which he has to master a new language or come to terms with a new language for care, which he exhibits much later on in the novel by making a dish that is very dear to his partner, right? And that felt like a trajectory that was a significant jump for anyone, like any one of us to make, right? To go from perhaps not being able to articulate oneself and what they would like to give to a partner or what they want to give to a loved one to being able to perhaps, if not a mastery of that language, but some comfort within it. Whereas his partner, Mike, has a fairly extensive culinary vocabulary and his journey became one in which he learned how not to force his own image and idea of care upon those around him so much as to intuit what they actually need 
right? Perhaps even if it doesn't align with what he believes that they need, right? Speaking as a, or rather listening as opposed to speaking. And that also felt like a pretty large jump for like a person, let alone a character to make, right? To really learn and to have a sense for what a partner's love language is or what a friend's love language is or what a family member, blood or otherwise, what their love language is. And between them, there's a character named Mitsuko who is the mother of one of these characters. And she felt like the thread and the gravity of the text for me because she's someone for whom when we meet her in the novel, she's told by her son, hey, I invited you to this country that you perhaps didn't have a great go of the first time you were here, but I'm leaving immediately. And also you're staying with my maybe partner for an indeterminate amount of time. That would be, a, to put it mildly, it would be a frustrating situation in which, you know, to find oneself it is out of nowhere. But the first thing that Mitsuko does is to cook a meal for this partner that she's never met before, creating an even keel, cre creating a place of solace and creating a place of care. And even if, as the novel progresses, the care that Mitsuko provides might seem abrasive to either of the young men, that's because it doesn't align with how they envision care, right? That's because they haven't seen or been exposed to that sort of honesty. That's because they haven't seen or been exposed to that transparency. And it's always undercut by the care providing a meal, the care providing warmth, or the care providing solace. So in many ways, the question of food for me was one that circled around what are the different ways in which we can care for those that we love and what are the different ways in which they can care for us and what happens when our respective ideas of care aren't quite aligning with one another you know like who is going to make the concession to change or to grow or to move one way or the other so it's important to me to have that idea of care there and it's also important to me to try to write the book in which characters did have the opportunity to grow and where they could come closer together if they chose to Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. I think, I think that we did it. We did. <laughs> we get everybody. Oh my goodness. Wow. What a night. What an evening. I want to thank again, Everett Shane, how are you feeling right now? I am ready for a celebratory cocktail. And yes. that was so much more fun than the time that I like got to like hold an Emmy while like someone was like being presented with the award. This was so much more fun than when I was a model for the Emmys or whatever you want to call it. I want to know about that, but later. Yeah, um, this was more fun. We're going to have to talk so. after this. It was good meeting you through this. Now there's like so many stories to catch up on. Um, thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank the authors again for being so amazing with their work and thoughtful in their questions and responses. Um, I want to thank Larry and Carrie for being a rhyming, dynamic, organizing duo and the tech team for being an awesome, just being there to support us throughout this. And especially want to thank uh, the booksellers who are here tonight. Uh, there are people um, and uh, Shane, it was lovely meeting you. Mm. Um, before everybody, before we sign off, I just wanna say that directly following this event, uh, the voting for the 2021 Heartland Booksellers Award will go live so you can actually vote um, after this. You can um, also watch this recording um, again. It will be uh, shared with all Gleba and Meba booksellers along with that voting ballot. Um, I think that's all that I have to announce. Once again, I just want to say thank you all so much um, and have a wonderful night. Let's get a big round of applause for yes. all of our nominees. Like so many congratulations. Yes. Um, just incredible people here this evening. And also uh, Kate, uh, you forgot to mention Kate who yeah. also was so great in helping uh, produce tonight's event. So yes. thank you, Kate. Thanks, Kate. All right.